Well, thank you for joining me this morning on Side by Side, and we're going to continue our our thinking, our reflections on the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 to 12 for the complete reading. But today we're thinking about, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. I'm going to look at this under two questions. First of all, why do they mourn? And secondly, how shall they be comforted? Progressing from the first beatitude of poor in spirit, which, when it is true and authentic, is going to lead to sorrow, as we considered yesterday, and true repentance will include the spirit of sorrow, saying, I am sorry, because I truly am. When I see what my sinful heart has done, the grief it has caused, the death of the perfect, sinless Jesus, and so much pain in our world, quite uncalculable, even if we think of sins of omission, the good we fail to do, let alone the bad we have done. Of course, as a motivation to attract others, mourning hardly does it. People want to belong to happy people. They lift our spirits, and there is a sense in which that's understandable. But that's not the whole story. Because the happy people, like the happy hour, pub happy hour, where alcohol's cheap for an hour, often ends up in sorrow, and it's very superficial and shallow. The sorrowful believer, on the other hand, will end up in comfort. Too superficial a look will mislead in both directions. So the avoidance of every cause of sadness, which is about the essence of our culture, is something that Jesus describes in this way. When Luke records it, he says, Woe to you who laugh now, emphasis on now, for you shall mourn and weep. As with each of the Beatitudes, the message is a spiritual message. It's not a physical message. It's about the heart. It's not about just running around with a smiling face on the outside. He is speaking, I think, about soul sorrow, not grief over death. And so when this beatitude is quoted at a funeral service, it's most likely entirely out of place. Just as the poor in spirit has nothing to do with wealth, so sorrow has little to do with bereavements. We ask ourselves this question, why is this mournful spirit, absent in church. Let me quote you a rather long quote that was written in 1959, at least it was published then, by Martin Lloyd-Jones. And this is what he says. This is partly a reaction against a kind of false Puritanism, which, let us be frank, was too much in evidence towards the end of the last century, that is the 19th century, and the beginning of the 20th. It often manifested itself in an assumed piety. It was not natural. It didn't come from within. But people had this outward pious appearance, and it gave the impression that to be religious was to be miserable. It turned its back on many things that are perfectly natural and legitimate, good, fun things. In that way, and that's my words, by the way, in that way, I quote again, a picture was given of the Christian man that was not attractive, And I think there's been a violent reaction against it. So violent, it's gone to the other extreme. But I also think that another explanation of this is the idea which also gained currency, that if we are to attract those who are not Christians, we must deliberately have this appearance of brightness and joviality. Thus many try to assume a kind of joy and happiness which is not something that rises from within, but something that's put on. Now, probably that is the main explanation of this, the absence of this characteristic of the mourning in the life of the church today. It is this superficiality, this glibness or joviality that is almost unintelligent. And I end the quotation there. Do you know, I couldn't help but thinking of that. That was written in 1959. The seeds of where we are today have been sown far, far back. Because he is quoting, going back to the beginning of the 20th century and the end of the 19th century. So here we are, over 100 years further on, still being affected by these things. And, you know, people talk to me about trends in church, you know, new church, this and that. Let me tell you, it's not about what happens in two years, three years. It's what happens over decades and generations. And that's another story we haven't time to look at. So... Let's think about this. No sense of sin 
no sense of God as our glorious holy God will never create a spirit of mourning. But let's go back to Isaiah 6, that momentous, very personal experience of the prophet Isaiah. And there we know, you know when I saw the Lord high and lifted up, and his glory filled the temple. That's that moment where he sees God. That's what we were talking about yesterday. What was the result of that? The result of that was, you know, woe is me, for I am a man of sinful lips. I am a, a sinful man, like Peter in the boat, depart from me, for I am a sinful man. You see, that experience of seeing God leads to a sorrow of heart, so that if we want to help others, we can't avoid or evade the question of sin. It's inadequate to speak only of trusting Jesus, following Jesus, or having Jesus as your friend. That Those are true, but they're not the complete truth. It's no more helpful than a doctor giving you multivitamins when what you really need is serious surgery. The Westminster Shorter Catechism describes, this is in New English, what is sin? Sin is disobeying or not conforming to God's law in any way. Disobeying or not conforming to God's law in any way. And we know God's law is summed up in the loving God with all heart, soul, mind, and strength, and loving neighbor as self. Those two things, those two directions. And what happens? It results in the loss of fellowship with God, living under his curse, with the future prospects of certain death and hell. Now, we mourn because of our sin, but we also mourn at the sins of others, don't we? Jesus was a man of sorrows who wept over the city. And I mean, take a simple thing. I go for a walk with the dog in the country road, and I see the carelessness and the selfishness of people who dump all their rubbish out on, on, along the side of the road. What does that do? It causes mourning in me over not just the rubbish, but over the spirit that causes people to be so selfish disregard other people. That's not loving your neighbor, you see. Just a small matter, a tiny thing, and I'm sure you can think of other things. But also, I mean, watch these days and observe what the priority in, in the world is to do. I mean, people cannot get back quick enough to shop, to restaurant, to holiday, to entertainment, to warehouses full of children and young people drinking. Just can't wait to go out and get drunk, one of them said. Now, I'm not being a killjoy, but you know what? It strikes me that with the pain of 13 months and 3 million plus deaths, there's something really selfish about that and sinful about that and something really rev rev revolting about that. But secondly, where is the comfort? Well, where is the blessedness? Joy is deeper than happiness, and I think this Joy is so deep that you can't sometimes see the smile, but it's there. It comes out in so many different ways. And true praise and true gladness and true joy, the comfort is found in the response of the Lord to our genuine sorrow. And go back to Isaiah 6. After Isaiah encounters the Lord as holy and high and lifted up, then the angel comes and, and he touches his mouth by taking a coal from off the altar and touching his mouth and lips and says, your guilt is taken away. Your sin is atoned for. The result of awakening from sin, followed by an awaken, awakening to sin, followed by an awakening to the mercy and grace of God, is comfort of the greatest proportion. It's the joy of forgiveness, the happiness of release, the delight of being welcomed into his fellowship. It's a far outlasting joy than you can find in any other place. I think it's summed up well in the words of Isaiah 61, where the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, proclaim liberty to the captive, open the prison to those who are bound, proclaim the year of the Lord's favour, the day of God, the day of vengeance of, of God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant to those who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, oil of gladness instead of mourning, garments of praise instead of a faint spirit. Wow, that is what we get when we realize our sin, it makes us sorrow, but in our sorrow we turn to the Lord and in his grace, this is what we get. Surely that will send us off with a depth of gladness 
never to be found anywhere else.